In the previous podcast, we saw how graphs could help us to understand the motion of objects and specifically be used to calculate their acceleration and the distance that they might have traveled. In this podcast, number 23, we're going to see how we can derive equations from these graphs and then apply these equations to calculate some of the motion parameters. Now, most of you will already know one equation of motion, and that is speed, or some of you might say rate, equals distance divided by time. But this is a special case equation that only applies to objects that are traveling at a constant speed, so there's no acceleration involved. The equations of motion that we're going to look at in this podcast are equations of uniformly accelerated motion, which means the objects are accelerating at a constant rate, like falling objects, for example. Let's look at an example of a falling object. So a diver, he climbs to the top of the high board, which is 10 meters above the water surface. Now he knows the height of the board is 10 meters, but what he actually wants to know is how fast he hits the water. All he knows is the height of the board, but he also knows that the acceleration of gravity is about 9.8 meters per second squared. So how can motion graphs help us to, or help him, to know the speed of impact with the water. Let's look at a velocity time graph of his motion. So this is the velocity or speed in this case, and this is the time. Um, now how can I plot this graph if I don't actually know the time it takes to fall? Well the answer is, I know the acceleration. So I know the acceleration is about 10 meters per second squared, and I know that the slope of a speed time graph is indeed the acceleration. So I must draw this line with a slope of 10. And if you look carefully, you can see that I've done that. Rise over run, all the way to the end. Rise is 50. Run is 5. 50 over 5 is 10. So this graph does represent the motion of the diver. But I've drawn the line way too long because there's no way that this diver is going to take five seconds to hit the water. So at the moment the slope of the graph is right but the graph is too long. So how long do I draw that line? How do I know how long to draw it? Well the area under a velocity time graph is the distance that the object travels. So this tells me that I should have stopped the line when the area under the graph was 10 meters. So this is what the graph should have looked like. I should have stopped somewhere around here so that this shaded area equals 10 meters. Area under a speed time graph is 10 meters. But it's difficult to determine where I should stop from my graph. It's not exactly at one second. Area under one second, 10 meters per second. That's one times 10 over two, that's five. Extended up as far as 2 seconds and 20. 2 times 20 is 40. Divide that by 2 because it's a triangle. That's 20. That's too much. So it's somewhere in between, but it's hard to know exactly where. So instead, what we could do is look at equations that we could derive from this graph that may help us. And there are actually four equations that we can derive from this graph, four equations of uniformly accelerated motion. But before we start deriving equations, let's take a look at the standard symbols we use in these equations. And there are four quantities that we use to help us to describe motion. So I've got the quantity, the symbol, and the unit. So the first quantity that we use to describe motion is time. Time, the symbol is t, and the unit is normally seconds. Displacement or distance traveled, we use the symbol s for that, and it's normally measured in meters. Now we have velocity as well, velocity or speed, and we've got the initial, the starting velocity, that's often zero, but not always zero. And we have the final velocity, the speed um, or velocity the object is traveling after it's traveled for t seconds. So both of those are measured in meters per second. And we've got the acceleration, the symbol is a, uh, meters per second squared. So these are the symbols that we use in the equations that we're going to look at. So as I said, in our example, and in many examples, the initial velocity, u, is zero. So the first equation of mo uniformly accelerated motion is, 
is derived from the slope of the velocity time graph. And we already know the relevance of the slope. We know that the slope is the acceleration. So the slope is rise over run. The rise is the change in velocity. And the run is the amount of time it took to change the velocity. So we have this word equation, acceleration equals change in velocity over time. This is what it looks like. The change in velocity is the final velocity minus the initial velocity. That's often zero, but not always. It's zero on my graph here, divided by the time it took. So in symbols, we've got this. We can rearrange that to give us this by multiplying both sides by t and then moving the uh, u to the other side. So we end up with v equals u plus at. So that's the first equation of motion. The second equation is also based on something that we already know. We already know that the area under the velocity time graph is the displacement or the distance traveled by the object. So this shaded area is the distance traveled. So we can develop an equation based on that as well. So the distance traveled, it's the area there which is the average velocity, the average velocity multiplied by the time. Average velocity multiplied by the time. Now the average velocity is the final velocity added to the initial velocity divided by 2. So it's just like working out the average of two numbers. That one plus that one divided by 2 gives you the average and multiplied by time. So we have this equation here. S for distance traveled equals V plus U over 2. That's the average velocity in the brackets multiplied by time. So there's two equations of uniformly accelerated motion derived from what we already knew, in fact. But neither of these two equations will actually tell us what we want to know, which is the impact speed with the water. V is the impact speed with the water. And there it is in both equations. But unfortunately, there's something else that we don't know as well. We don't know T. We don't know how long it takes the person to hit the water. I guess we could take a stopwatch out, but in actual fact, we don't need to. What we can do instead is we can actually combine these two equations and eliminate t. So we only have one unknown variable v. This is how we do it. So firstly, I'm going to rearrange that top equation. I'm going to rearrange it. I'm going to take u back over to the other side. It becomes negative. I'm going to divide through by a. So I get this equation here. Now what I'm going to do is instead of t here, I'm going to write down v minus u over a right here. I'm going to take the v minus u over a, and I'm going to put it in right there. So how does that look? We've got this equation, but instead of t, I've got v minus u over a. I've just substituted it right in. I'm going to simplify that, rearrange it, take the 2 and the a over to the other side, multiply through by 2 and a, so that's what I get. And then I'm going to multiply out the brackets, and this is what I get. So this is another equation now. This is my third equation of uniformly accelerated motion, and you can see that t has vanished. I now only have v, u, a, and s. I want to know v. u is the starting velocity, which is 0. 2, acceleration, I know, and the height of the board, I also know. So let's go ahead and use this equation to work out the impact speed. So u is 0, as we've said already, so we're left with v squared, equals 2as. Now if I square root both sides, I get v equals the square root of 2as. Putting the numbers in, we've got 2 times the acceleration of gravity, 9.8, multiplied by 10, the height of the board, which gives me 14 meters per second. So I've calculated the impact speed to be 14 meters per second. So with the last equation, we had to derive this equation from the first two because we wanted to eliminate the t. We didn't know t. And in fact, each of these equations is useful because each of these equations has one of the variables of motion missing. Look at the first equation. What's missing? S, displacement, is missing. Look at the second equation. What's missing? A, the acceleration, is missing. And look at the third equation. We already know that t is missing. 
So it follows that we should be able to derive another equation where v is missing. So if we didn't know and didn't really care about v, we could actually work out some of the other parameters. So let's derive equation 4. Let's build it again from the first and second equations. So there's the first and the second equation. This time I need to eliminate v. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply take what is v here, and v is u plus at, and I'm going to drop that straight into this equation here. This is v, so instead of writing v, I'm going to write u plus at. Let's see how that looks. So I've dropped in u plus at instead of v. So I've got u plus u plus at. The divided by 2 is still there, and the multiplied by t is still there, which becomes this. I can, I've added the two u's together. Everything else is just the same. Now if I multiply through by the t, we get 2ut plus at squared over 2. And finally, I get this here. I've cancelled the 2 here with the 2 here, but the, the 2 is still here underneath the second part, so I've called that half at squared. So we get s equals ut plus half at squared. And that's the fourth and final equation of uniformly accelerated motion. And we can see that in this one, there is no v. And as the initial speed is often zero, this piece here is often uh, taken away. So let's see how we can use this equation. And uh, we'll use it to work out the time it takes for the diver to hit the water. So we've got the equation, s equals ut plus half at squared. U is 0, so we can forget that part. So we have s equals half at squared. We need to rearrange the equation to give us t equals the square root of 2s over a. So I've multiplied both sides by 2, then I've divided both sides by a to get 2s over a, and then I've taken a square root of both sides to cancel out the t squared part. Put the numbers in. 2 times 10, the height of the board is 10, and the acceleration is 9.81. Square root of that, 2 times 10 over 9.8, which is 2.04, is 1.43 seconds. So it takes the diver 1.43 seconds to reach the water. So in summary, from the velocity time graph alone, we can derive four equations of uniformly accelerated motion, each one with one key variable eliminated. So you simply choose which equation to use based on the variables that you know. So equation 1, distance or displacement is missing. Equation 2, acceleration is missing. Equation 3, t, time is missing. And equation 4, v is missing.